uh, in collaboration with OSPI and SBCTC. It is October 23rd. Our webinar is going to go from 9.30 to 11 a.m. this morning. Uh, my name is Stephanie Rock. I am a policy associate in student services and K-12 alignment at the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. And I have the pleasure uh, to kick us off this morning. I wanted to introduce uh, Kristen Jowey. She's our program administrator of student services and K-12 alignment. She is the administrator and uh, manager of the Bridge to College program. And she is now going to be helping us uh, SBCTC with uh, dual credit support as well. So really happy to, to introduce Kristen this morning. And then kind of wrapping it up, we also have Jamie Trauga on our call. She is the Director of Student Services and K-12 Alignment at the Washington State Board for Community Technical Colleges. Uh, really happy to have her uh, support us here on this call. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn it on over to OSPI for introductions as well. Hi, good morning, everybody. My name is Tim McLean. I'm the Dual Credit Program Supervisor here at OSPI. I really appreciate your attendance today and your interest in the topics that we have to present on. I am joined here with uh, Sarah Fapiano, who is our administrative assistant for all things dual credit, a recent, relatively recent addition to the OSPI family and doing exceptional work. She's also going to be helping us with our clock hours um, and managing that process for those of you from the K-12. Uh, system here today. So uh, we'll get into that momentarily. Uh, in the meantime, I'll pass it back to Stephanie. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tim. And I did just want to let everyone know that we are recording uh, this webinar. We'll get into housekeeping in just a minute, but I did want to let everyone know ahead of time that we are going to be recording and getting this video out to everybody. All right, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Thank you, Sarah. All right, so we have a very full agenda for you all today. Uh, we are going to touch on our dual credit updates bulletin that OSPI just dropped yesterday. So we will be, um, Tim will be going through that and, and detailing out um, um, what that looks like. We're gonna talk about our FAQ updates, uh, our, our FAQ updates that we have for Running Start, our um, exam-based uh, dual credit programs, and then our college and the high school um, FAQ. So we have had some updates. We do a yearly um, update to those. And so we'll go through that and what those updates are. We are gonna talk dual credit reports and data. We're going to also touch on summer running start. Let's talk about that. Uh, what are some takeaways? We're going to uh, do have a little bit of a brief overview. And then uh, finally, we're going to go through uh, our running start um, enrollment verification uh, form. And uh, we really welcome some feedback. So we'll talk about what that's going to look like uh, towards the end of our session today. And then at the very end, we're going to have an opportunity for Q&A from you all. So looking really forward to, to conversating and sharing all this great information with you all. All right, next slide. So before we jump into it, a couple of housekeeping items. Stephanie has already mentioned that we are recording this presentation. Uh, we are recording it to provide good professional development and accessible uh, on-demand professional development. But also we are doing our first attempt at offering um, asynchronous clock hours um, for this opportunity. If you are here today and you are hoping to receive clock hours for today, um, there is a QR code you can scan. The opportunity is available currently for this synchronous presentation in PD and Roller. Um, go ahead and you can scan that and make sure that your email in PD and Roller matches what you registered with today. If you should have any problems with the clock hour uh, registration process, Sarah, who I introduced momentarily, or who I moments ago, um, would be your point of contact. Uh, she can be reached at gradteam at k12.wa.us for any questions around clock hours. Um, again, this is going to be offered as an asynchronous opportunity. When the posting is available, you'll be notified through both SBCTC and OSPI listservs. Um, you can also simply keep your eye out on our websites um, or YouTube channels, I'm sorry, um, for those uh, for the recording. And at that point, there will be a new um, asynchronous clock hour entry uh, within the 
uh, PD enroller program and you can go, you won't need to because you're here today, uh, but your colleagues may. Um, so that's clock hours. Any questions we can address at the end. I also wanted to touch base on questions and the Q&A opportunities that we're gonna have today. We will end the recording at the end of the standard presentation and then move into a Q&A session, at which point uh, it will be more open format. We will stop the recording and answer your questions then. With that in mind, we'd ask that you um, please hold your, your questions for the most part until the end. And ideally we would ask that if you have very specific in the weeds case study type questions that are very specific to your institution or a particular student that you hold that and address that with us offline um, whether it's stephanie at sbctc or me at the at um, ospi we can address some of those more nettlesome questions individually and ask that you keep your questions high level and um, use the raise hand function or the q a so that we can track your questions as we go um, we do have a mixed audience today, so I would uh, beg of you as we get into Q&As that we all assume positive intent and, and recognize that we are all here to do what's best for students. Um, and with that, we will dive right in and get into the content of today's session, starting with our dual credit updates bulletin. We have lost the presentation, it appears. Um, so I am happy to sort of intro this while we wait for that to come back online. Um, but the OSPI dual credit bulletin is number 067-24. Um, it dropped on Monday and was posted to our bulletins site for which you'll have a link in just a moment um, on Tuesday. And that addresses a number of things, um, which are listed out on the next slide, if we can move to that. Um, probably first and foremost, um, or at least first in line, is uh, information on substitute House Bill 1146. This is one of the more significant things that came out of last session. It addresses dual credit notification at the local level. And uh, we're gonna touch on that in more detail momentarily. Um, it also uh, addresses running start access and questions of equity and access to running start in light of substitute House Bill 1316, which uh, passed in, in the 2013 session. Um, we will also touch on college and the high school transcription guidance and growth. Um, pursuant to substitute Senate Bill 5046, um, 5048, I'm sorry, and the test fee subsidy program, um, which will be available yet again this year, as well as technical assistance and professional development opportunities. So as I mentioned, uh, we lead off with substitute House Bill 1146. What this instructs, um, high schools and districts to provide is an annual notice of each dual credit program that is available to students and the financial assistance associated with those programs. It has to go out to buy all schools that are serving grades nine through 12. And it needs to go to both students and parents or legal guardians. We highly recommend this going out as early as the eighth grade, and I'll get into the details as to why, um, but this is now a requirement. Every program has had various types of requirement about the dual credit program, um, all with different nuances. This is an attempt to really consolidate um, your efforts into a single notification that would go out. Um, it should be going out annually uh, by email and other methods such as websites, handbooks, catalogs, the high school and beyond plan, but email is absolutely required and it needs to be translated or translatable into the primary language of the recipient and to the extent feasible, accessible to individuals with disabilities. As I mentioned, it has to go out annually um, and it needs to go out prior to course scheduling for the next term. So typically that would be um, by the winter um, advisory period at which students are starting to consider their courses for the upcoming school year. Um, 
This is in light of a, a significant investment in dual credit, as I've mentioned, through 5048 and 1316. The legislature um, certainly wants to see a return on that investment by ensuring that students are aware of all the options that are available to them. And of course, we are ultimately concerned with equity and making sure that these opportunities are available to all students and not particular students sets of students or a particular type of student, um, the importance here is that this is made available to everyone um, in an equitable and accessible fashion. Um, we know that dual credit has equity gaps um, and participation gaps that are very clear along demographic lines. So this is an opportunity to address that. Um, we are working on a template that will be provided soon. Um, that hopefully will ease the lift on the part of districts and schools um, that you will have a some boilerplate text to bring um, forward in doing this work. And um, with that, I'll go to the next slide and kind of talk a little bit more about the nuance. Um, as I mentioned, each dual credit program has their own notification requirements. Um, we have requirements along the lines of academic acceleration. We have specific notification requirements about college and the high school and about running start. What this is ultimately doing is tying all of these together. If done well, it should serve to streamline things and make things easier as opposed to um, being an additional burden on schools and districts. It's not new. Um, what they're requesting isn't necessarily new, it's just a consolidation um, of these various um, notification requirements. And um, what it also does is it highlights the opportunities for, for financial assistance for students to ensure, again, equity and access for all. So some of the examples of these financial assistance opportunities would be running start waivers at each college for uh, students who are classified as low income. Um, it would include exam fee subsidies for students who are FRPL eligible. Um, includes the fact that we are now state funding the college and the high school courses that students might wish to take for college credit. Um, we also have other resources that your district or your school may or may not be taking advantage of. Um, the Consolidated Equity and Sustainability Grant is one example. Um, there is opportunity to support students through that grant, and I'll be talking about that in a moment. And also, um, we really want to highlight the Washington Student Achievement Council's Dual Enrollment Scholarship. Now, I will mention that that application has closed for the year, and we don't know what the future holds for that program, um, but it is critically important that we at least um, make reference of the fact that it is out there and that it may or may not be continuing. So that again will go into a template um, and some text that you can borrow and adapt to fit your needs. Um, so that is the long and short about um, 1146. Uh, there's a lot more detail in the bulletin. This is purely an overview. Um, so we will go on to the next topic included in the bulletin. And that pertains to Running Start access. As I mentioned, um, 1316 was a huge investment in Running Start. It increased the FTE limit to 1.4. It opened Running Start. It made uh, Running Start, I'm sorry, Summer Running Start. It made Running Start available to rising juniors. All of this was pretty monumental and it was a significant shift and a significant investment. Um, so one of the things we wanted to highlight in this bulletin and that I personally, as a program supervisor, wanted to highlight are some of the common um, things that have come up in my efforts at providing technical assistance around Running Start Access. Um, RCW 28A600-310 reads that every school district must, and that's my underline, allow students described in section two, which is the eligibility requirements um, to participate in the Running Start program. Um, and RCW down the line makes very clear that OSPI's rules need to be written to encourage maximum use and not to narrow enrollment options. 
for Running Start. I say that to reinforce the fact that Running Start access, that these statements, they need to be taken at face value. It's very clear to us that the legislature intends Running Start to be available equitably to all students. And so on that note, um, what we've included in the bulletin are some examples and some clarification and guidance around where we are seeing barriers to access. And I'll go through those really briefly um, as they're listed on the screen. Um, one is refusal um, to provide access to Running Start outright. And a lot of times we see that in um, schools or districts indicating, well, we don't have an MOU with a particular college, therefore you can't attend that college. Um, MOUs are largely a thing of the past. They can be helpful at a local level if you have a particular feeder college um, that you work closely with, but to be very clear, MOUs have not been required in, in ages, certainly before my time. Um, so, so students should not be pro prohibited from attending Running Start at the college of their choice. Um, provided it's an eligible college to offer Running Start. Um, and so we're seeing oftentimes that students are saying are being told you can't go to that college. Um, but with the advent of online Running Start through the pandemic and the like, students can attend Running Start at any college that they wish. Um, we are also seeing um, examples of students who are being denied the opportunity to enroll in Running Start because of a grade point average, or because they haven't taken a particular high school class, or because they haven't succeeded in Running Start previously. Um, these have never been allowable. There's a fine line between what is responsible and um, diligent counseling and ensuring that students understand the pros and cons of a program like Running Start, um, but never should a student who has been enrolled, uh, I'm sorry, accepted into a college, been denied the opportunity to participate in Running Start through that college. Um, this is one that comes up quite frequently, and we understand that as counselors, for those of you who are on this call, that can often be very challenging to, to see a student who is having a hard time. But the reality is that there are students who function far better in a college environment than they might in a high school environment. Um, and we have a lot of data to bring to bear on this, which I'll get into a little bit later, that indicates Running Start is wildly successful. Um, we hear all the horror stories, but in fact, it is a wildly successful program with over 95% pass rates uh, across the state. So students should not be um, selectively admitted or, or enrolled into the Running Start program. Um, another thing that's addressed in the bulletin are caseload and term restrictions. We hear quite frequently that students are either required to go to run, Running Start full time, or they're limited on the other hand um, to only a certain amount of Running Start classes. Um, neither of those are permissible. Um, we have also heard about uh, places in which students are told you have to start Running Start in the fall. You can't access Running Start in the spring or in the summer. Um, if it was not started in the fall, in the fall that too um, is not permitted. Uh, RSEVF deadlines has been a very common topic recently. Um, there is definitely a need at the local level to institute soft deadlines for RSEVF submission in order to plan for the upcoming school. That we understand. If you need to know in the spring as a school or a district how many students are going to be participating in Running Start, that's an entirely acceptable thing to request. Where we are running into questions is, can a student be denied the opportunity to enroll in Running Start in the fall or in the over the summer months if they did not meet a spring deadline? And the answer is no. Um, students are subject to the college's enrollment um, and registration calendar. Um, so while we understand the need to, um, for fiscal and course planning, get as much information as we possibly can in the spring, we cannot by law deny an eligible student the opportunity to enroll after that deadline has passed. Um, high school honors and activities are another one that come up quite frequently. 
we hear that students are not considered for valedictorian or salutatorian honors, for instance, if they are running start students, or that there are criteria for those honors that preclude running start students, such as a certain course load at the high school in a particular term, usually it's senior year, um, that you have to take a class on the high school campus in your senior year to be eligible for these honors. Um, those are discouraging factors. Um, that forces a student to change their academic planning um, to be eligible for something that can have long-term impacts on their future. A student who is denied the opportunity to be valedictorian may lose scholarship funding, may use the opportunity to attend a highly selective school because they were not their school's valedictorian simply because of a very arbitrary um, policy. Uh, we understand that there are some honors that require a level of student participation and contribution to the school, and that is understandable. This is a local decision, but we want to be clear in saying that these policies should not outright um, preclude running start students from having a shot at these honors. Um, they should be very well spelled out and the justification very clear. And on a similar note, we have grade weighting policies. Local grade weighting um, is permissible. We have, come, we have come up against some questions about why running start grades are not being weighted when things like honors or AP or college in the high school are. Um, running start, if you are employing a weighted grading policy, running start absolutely should be comparable to any other dual credit program. There should be no reason when you're talking about a college course that's taken on a college campus with a college faculty member, um, that that is weighted any lower than an AP course, which in fact is not a college course by its nature. Um, so that's a very important thing to recognize because again, this has major impacts on students. If they are taking running start and yet those courses aren't weighted, they slip in their class rankings. That can affect scholarship opportunities, financial aid opportunities, and um, selection into very selective institutions. That was a lot. <laughs> and I, I'm seeing things ping on my screen, so I know there are questions. Um, believe it or not, that was just a sampling. There's a lot more in the bulletin that's going to flesh that out for you, and we'll have an opportunity to respond to the questions shortly. In the meantime, we also talk about high, uh, college in the high school in the bulletin. Um, one of the things that we are really encouraging, albeit we are not requiring, um, because we cannot do that without a rule change, we are re really encouraging districts to transcribe the college in the high school college on the high school transcript. That can be done in two ways or both. Um, it could be done as a, an inclusion of that college in the school's attended section of the transcript, or when it comes to um, writing the course title, we would really encourage an acronym for the college to be included with the course title. The reason we're suggesting this is there was a recent audit um, through the state auditor's office on the transferability of dual credit. And what it found is that that College in the high school courses are 15% less likely than running start to be transcribed um, and utilized. The credits utilized in a student's post-secondary um, activities. Uh, reason being in large part, they discovered that the students don't often know where their credits are coming from. Um, they enroll through the high school and may not know um, even at the time of enrollment or, or perhaps later, they may have forgotten what college they were participating through. And furthermore, when their high school transcript makes it to the college, the college does not have any method of following up on whether credits were earned through college in the high school because they cannot see the, the college in question. And if the student doesn't know that, we're seeing much lower rates of credit transcription among college and the high school students. Um, likewise, we are very intentionally 
trying to do more in terms of providing guidance and instructions in our FAQs, for instance, and in this very professional development session, we need students to know um, at every opportunity how credit transfer works, not just how to get it transcribed, because in the case of college and the high school, it always is, but how to get that credit to the receiving institution that they wish to attend. So whatever we can do to highlight those procedures in the course syllabi, in the dual credit notification through 1146 that we just talked about, um, through your advisory processes, through course registration materials and in-course catalogs, we really want to encourage schools and districts um, to add a little more substance around the process of credit transfer so that students um, get those levels of, of transfer up. Um, finally, we talk in the bulletin a lot about growth. College and the high school, uh, by my understanding, and my post-secondary uh, colleagues can, can jump in if I'm incorrect, but I heard through the grapevine that the college and the high school enrollment was up almost 10,000 students with the passage of 5048. Um, it's, having the intended, um, it's having the intended outcomes being met. And so we really encourage um, you to start planning for growth in college and the high school that may come in the form of co-delivery with other dual credit options such as AP or CTE dual credit. Um, it comes with greater notification of the availability of state funding supporting these efforts that there is no longer a cost to students to access college and the high school for college credit. Um, it it would be addressing the pros and cons of college and the high school for college credit. Um, much like Running Start, there are opportunities to do that. That is responsible guidance, um, helping students understand that this does establish a college transcript. What does that mean for them? Um, so increasing that level of guidance. And I skipped the first bullet. Um, and that is that we are offering um, and recognizing the need for more postgraduate um, coursework on the part of teachers to be taken to be eligible for college in the high school. So our Consolidated Equity and Sustainability Grant will now fund up to $15,000 um, for postgraduate coursework and certification um, for CTE specifically um, to get more teachers ready um, to offer these opportunities to students. Um, so we as an agency are trying to put our money where our mouth is and, and acknowledge the fact that we need more teachers um, to make this growth uh, possible. And so we want to invest in that. Next. On that note, uh, that brings us to the Consolidated Equity and Sustainability Grant uh, that I just referenced. This grant, if you're unfamiliar with it, is for um, school districts specifically. I apologize to my college counterparts. Um, this is speaking to my, my team. Um, and it is due on November 1st. It's currently open in EGMS. And please take note of that if you have ever um, applied previously. We have moved out of iGrants. We are now exclusively in EGMS. And so the Consolidated Equity and Sustainability Grant may cover um, a variety of things. It will cover professional development and training, which I mentioned before now includes the opportunity to assist teachers in pursuing postgraduate co coursework to be eligible for college and the high school instruction. Um, it also would include CTE certification and any other professional development that pertains directly to dual credit. This is a dual credit specific grant. Um, but it will cover professional development that is relevant. Um, it will also cover investments in CTE dual credit, which we know is by and large an unfunded mandate. Um, we know that we need to be offering CTE dual credit. It's a very successful program. It's a very equitable program, um, but we know it's underfunded. So um, these funds can go towards CTE dual credit and CTE graduation path pathways more generally. Um, it can cover equipment and supplies. Those are often attached to CTE programs. Um, however, we have scaled this back because of the amount that was being spent in this category in past years. And we are really 
targeting this um, for districts under 2000 students who have the greatest um, financial need. Um, so that is a recent change. Um, it can also uh, fund any efforts whatsoever to um, provide outreach to underrepresented student populations. We know what they are. Um, dual credit is, is historically um, uh, inaccessible to low-income students in particular, where there's about a 24% gap in participation, but also various demographic groups. So anything that your uh, school or district wants to do to improve those numbers is ac acceptable with these grant funds. And then finally, summer administrative costs. We know that 1316 presented us a, a challenge in trying to administer a summer program when schools are closed. Um, so we are, again, putting our money where our mouth is and acknowledging that this went unfunded and we, um, we are hoping to alleviate some of that strain by offering these funds. Um, the grant is up to a maximum of 75,000 per district. Um, it does need to be a district level application for what that's worth. And um, again, they're due November 1st. So we're down to about a week. I apologize, I have um, lost my video and I do not know why, but it is back. Um, and I will take that opportunity to pivot into our test fee subsidy program only to mention that we will continue our past process. Um, test fee subsidies have historically been offered um, through OSPI. We have a direct billing agreement with, uh, the, with the College Board for Advanced Placement um, for students who are FRPL eligible. And we also have another grant, it's Form Package 686 um, for Cambridge International and International Baccalaureate. Um, I'll cut that a little bit short because the details are in the bulletin, but I wanted to highlight the fact that those programs are ongoing and um, will be available again this year. Okay, I happily hand it over to Stephanie at this point um, <laughs> to, to jump into frequently asked question updates um, and we will tag team through this um, but I will hand it to Stephanie for a moment and catch my breath. Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> Thank you, Tim, for all of that wonderful information. I know that there's a lot of questions that are coming in in the Q&A. Uh, we're really excited to, to help answer those in a little bit here. So thanks so much for um, being engaged with us and asking the questions. Um, so yeah, so we annually update our FAQs for College and High School Running Start and for our, um, <clears throat> excuse me, our exam-based dual credit. And so here we, we just thought instead of just uh, sharing the FAQs with you all, we, which we will and have, um, but we thought it would be helpful to kind of walk through some of the changes that were made this year annually. So um, for Carlton High School, uh, there is language to reflect the passage of our House Bill uh, 2, uh, 2441. Um, which again, that's elimination of college and high school fees. Um, so there's additional language there. Uh, there's clarification on state funding and fees. Uh, there is a little bit of reorganization, uh, new and revised sections you'll find as well. And there's additional guidance on transcription, transfer, and high school and transcript uh, notation, as Tim kind of highlighted earlier. Uh, so those are kind of what you'll find of, in terms of changes for the college and high school FAQ. And then for Running Start, we actually have added 13 new questions, which our next slide, we will share with you what those questions are and the numbers. Uh, so you'll have some awareness of where to find those new questions. I know I think that was one of the questions in the chat earlier. Are there going to be some additions with this information that's going out in the bulletin? Yes, to the Running Start, yes. Um, and we'll go through that in just a minute. Uh, we actually added the inclusion of the Running Start Technical Guide in the FAQ. So several questions will will have a link to that Running Start Technical Guide for support and um, uh, assistance as you're, you're trying to navigate through the document. Uh, we've updated links and resources. Uh, there's an emphasis on credit transfer and the high school and beyond uh, pathway guidance. Um, yeah, we uh, just mentioned the RCW here. Every school district must allow eligible students as described in subsection two, as, as uh, Tim highlighted earlier, of the section to participate in the Running Start um, program. So a lot of additions to the FAQ of what was talked about earlier by Tim. And, um, and then there's definitely reference to the uh, House Bill 1146, as Tim mentioned earlier, um, and as well as... Um, 
sorry, my screen is hidden, um, as well as uh, our uh, uh, Senate Bill 5670, um, which is um, providing summer running start to rising juniors. And then when we look at our exam-based um, college preparatory programs with exams, there's updated links and resources. Uh, there's that reference to the House Bill 1146. And then there's a distinction between uh, transfer credit and transfer students. So those are really the updates to the documents um, in general that you'll find the changes that we've made in collaboration all together with our HC agencies. All right, uh, next slide. Okay. And then I think I'm turning this back over to you, but I will mention one, right, Tim? Yeah, that was our plan. Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, so we're not going to go through every single new question um, one by one, but we highlighted a few um, that we thought we could touch on because there's maybe more nuance to it um, than than we might that we might just want to flesh it out a little bit. Um, so number nine, one thing that has been coming up quite frequently is the question of early dismissal and missed classes to participate in Running Start. Um, that one was a last minute addition um, because it was coming up so frequently um, that there was a perception that schools who were not allowing students to miss their high school classes or were not dismissing students uh, early or accepting them late we're somehow throwing up barriers to running start participation. I, I wanted to make really clear because we have a, a joint audience today um, that, that that's perfectly within the purview of the school. Um, the school does not need to uh, dismiss a student early or allow a student to miss classes for which they're enrolled at the high school to access Running Start. That's by no means a barrier. That's an expectation that the school has for their students. And so we provided some clarity in the FAQ around that question. Um, another thing that has been coming up often is Running Start access beyond the age of 21. That is associated with the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruling um, that extends um, disability benefits and services to students until the age of 22. I don't want to get too far into the weeds um, with respect to the disability law associated with this, except to say at this time that that ruling does not have impact on Running Start. It does not extend Running Start eligibility for these students because Running Start eligibility is established in a different statute. Um, it still speaks to students who are 21 um, very specifically. And so this ruling does not trump existing statute pertaining to running start. The bottom line, as I understand it from um, my team here at OSPI, is if a district wishes to allow a student to persist with running start, they may, but they will not be funded for that. Running Start funded, funding is not permitted beyond that. Um, so there is a cost that would need to be absorbed by the district. So there's more clarity in the FAQ around this. I wanted to touch on it um, since we had the joint audience here today. Um, I mentioned this previously. There's There have been questions about whether an MOU is required for a student to participate in Running Start. It's a fairly simple answer, and that is no. A student may access Running Start at any participating institution, especially with online Running Start. They can go just about anywhere, and there is not an MOU requirement and hasn't been for some time. Stephanie, did you want to jump in on number 61? Absolutely. We added 61. It basically speaks to advanced level courses and that if uh, a Running Start student is eligible based on just like any other college student, that's Running Start students are eligible to take 200 level and above courses as long as they meet those course prerequisites. So just adding that to the FAQ, that question comes up here and there. So yes, 300, 400. Um, and so on, as long as they're there, they meet those prereqs for that course. So just added that in there. And the last question that we wanted to highlight, again, this is not all of them, and you're welcome to go dig in on your own. Um, but the question of summer running start for graduating seniors has come up repeatedly. Um, we have previously had the advantage of the after exit proviso 
um, that allowed students to persist into the summer beyond their senior year if they were within 15 credits of an associate degree. We don't know the future of the after exit proviso. So I wanted to make that clear from, from the start. The after exit proviso is a proviso. So it's subject to annual reauthorization. And we don't know if we're going to see that this year, um, especially with some of the data I'm going to touch on in a moment. And the fact that we have a 1.4 AAFTE limit um, that should not necessarily require an after exit prov proviso moving forward. That said, um, the question has come up around gradu graduating students and whether they can pend graduation um, and persist into the summertime. That has been a bit of a gray area, but we're here to clarify today that we are going to permit that. Um, existing rule stipulates that if a student has not met their graduation requirements by credit, at the beginning of a school year, they may persist into running start through the duration of that school year. And we both operate and interpret the school year to include summer. A summer is a continuation of that year's school year. And so by our interpretation of existing statute, we are going to allow students to do that. The one caveat to that is a student who chooses to essentially pend graduation in other words, would, el would be eligible to graduate in June, but wishes to pursue running start in the summer. Number one, they have to have FTE available. Unlike uh, the after exit proviso, this is still subject to FTE. They can't just do it with money that's not available through the B their BEA. They have to have FTE and they will then graduate in August. So these are important conversations to have with these students that they need to recognize if they choose to go this route, they are not June graduates. They are August graduates. Um, they are still graduates of 2025. Their, their cohort year will not change, um, but they will not actually be graduated as a June graduate, nor will their final transcripts be made available. Their official high school transcript would not be available until grades are posted in August. Um, so this may require conversations with their receiving institutions of higher education. Um, and we've provided some guidance on this in the past about why my official high school transcript is not yet available. We really encourage districts to provide some backing information to suggest this is what the student is doing. This is why we ask that you accept their unofficial high school transcript for the moment. And, and provide kind of a formal letter um, to their the, the institutions at which they're applying. Again, more and, and clearly more clearly stated in the um, FAQ itself. All right. Um, from there, we're going to pivot into some highlighting some new reports and data. Some of this um, is why we've made changes that we're talking about today. Some of it is just really cool to see. Um, and so I'm going to start us off with two reports that are out um, that you may be interested in. I'm sorry, one report that is out, another one that is coming. Um, starting with the ERDC's annual dual credit report. They've been doing this now for three years. Um, the ERDC, for those who don't know the acronym, is the Education Research and Data Committee, Council, something with a C. Um, and they are responsible for bridging the gap between uh, data that is held at the K-12 level and data that is held at higher ed. And they bring this data together to produce an annual report on dual credit that used to come out of OSPI. Um, I really encourage you to look at this if you haven't already, because it includes an interactive data dashboard by which you can slice and dice the data and look at do different student populations and look at trend analyses um, and longitudinal data. Um, I tend to nerd out on this stuff, and um, I'm sure some of us on the call are, are like-minded. So um, really do um, encourage you to look at that. Um, there's a lot of promising information in there that you may or may not have known about, um, that 80 to 100 percent of students participate in dual credit in most districts. Um, we, we have 
a huge rate of participation, um, very much bolstered by CTE dual credit. But in general, um, we are a very strong state in terms of students' access to dual credit, and that's demonstrated in the report. Um, it also demonstrates that 91 percent of participants in dual credit earn credits, um, college credits, and I'm sorry, earn high school credits through dual credit, um, and they they have higher GPAs on average um, than students that don't participate. This year, a new addition to the report that I was really enthused about um, was the addition of 10 heat maps um, that demonstrate where dual credit is being offered by district and what percentage of students are participating in each type of dual credit by district. So if you are a district or a school that is wanting to dive into college in the high school, but you're not sure who your neighbors are who are doing it well or are doing it at scale, these heat maps are a really cool addition um, I would encourage you to dive into. The other thing about the ERDC reports is that they have um, related reports that they issue almost on a quarterly basis. Um, that fleshes out some of the big aggregate data and looks at specific uh, outcomes. And so they have a post-secondary enrollment report or brief. They have a post-secondary credential attainment brief. Uh, and they did a special report on CTE dual credit outcomes. All of these for me are really enlightening. So I just wanted to highlight them. Uh, the second thing that I wanted to highlight is not yet available, um, but it is in its final um, final process of approval and formatting and so forth. It is our OSPI Running Start Legislative Report, which was a new addition um, with respect to House Bill 1316. Um, it includes a supplemental data dashboard um, by which you can look at your Running Start enrollment down to the district level. You could also look at it by ESD, by county, um, it's going to, the report is going to pair with this dashboard, which uh, my colleague Andrew Nelson just did a phenomenal job on. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, quick data points is that um, running start with the increase to 1.4 and everything that we've already talked about hit an all time high um, by a pretty decent margin, um, especially after some declines following the pandemic. Um, running start was hugely popular. Um, we saw 14,000 more student, more credits earned, which equates to about almost 3,000 more courses taken over the course of the year. Um, but one thing I wanted to highlight, because it was a concern when the change was made to a 1.4, we are actually seeing a more um, representative split between Running Start students attending both Running Start at a college and high school courses. There was a fear early on that, oh, students are just going to flock to the colleges and we're going to lose that, um, that BEA. Um, but in fact, we have seen a downward trend in full-time Running Start enrollment. And I, it, a downward trend never sounds positive, uh, but it it is in this respect because we are seeing students take advantage of new flexibility and they are being able to um, to pursue their high school graduation re requirements at the high school and still take a four, full course load at the college. And so we're actually seeing full time running start down to 40 percent. Um, and in 2022, even during the pandemic um, or on, on the tail end of it, that was 40, almost 47%. So we are seeing a greater split um, in the amount of credits that are being taken. Other things haven't changed very much. 80%, uh, 20% uh, split in high school and college FTE. Um, that's been consistent for years. Um, so we're not seeing huge monumental shifts, except that we are seeing students uh, taking advantage of more flexibility and a great, greater variety of options. Um, the, the number of students participating is pretty consistent with past trends at 15 to 17% of eligible students participating running start. That's not showing significant shifts. But what I mentioned earlier that I really wanted to highlight is the 96.4% pass rate. 
for running start because believe you believe you me i hear the horror stories and i know that it's difficult at the local level to see students struggle in running start and we tend to focus on the students that take the greatest amount of our attention and bandwidth to get them back on track but the reality of this program is that 96 percent are passing and even an even better data point is 83 percent of running start students are receiving a's or b's um so i wanted to to elevate that because i hear i hear it all the time these, these students they they go into running start and they're not ready they're ready and let me just say really clearly they are ready um as evidenced by this data um Finally, uh, we're going to talk about summer running start in greater depth in a moment, but we saw a five-fold increase in summer running start when we had a year to plan and prepare for it, and when we had all of our ducks in a row legislatively, um, summer running start was a huge success. We, we saw a five-fold uh, increase, and we'll talk more about that in a moment, but lots of exciting things going on. Um, and I encourage you to look at this report when it comes out, you'll certainly be notified on the listservs. All right. Thank you, Tim. Uh, and so some additional uh, reports and data we just wanted to briefly mention. Uh, we have our CTE dual credit pilot that's going on in the Northwest ESD 189 um, area with um, our pilot colleges, Bellingham Technical College, uh, Everett Community College, Skagit Valley College, and Whatcom Community College. We're seeing positive and encouraging results already. We don't have the report out yet. It will be available soon. Uh, that is being spearheaded by Bill Belden at the State Board for Community Technical Colleges. He's a policy associate in workforce education. So if you have any questions, we, we included his email there. Um, but basically, the goal of the proviso, the pilot, is to increase CTE dual credit participation and credential attainment uh, through those professional technical uh, programs and those partnerships. So really looking forward to seeing um, the report. Uh, stay tuned for more information about that. But we wanted to put that on your radar in terms of CTE dual credit. And then I'm going to move over to pivot to our college and high school enrollment report. Uh, the leads there are Julie Garber with uh, Council of Presidents and Jamie Chaugat, uh, our Director of Student uh, Services and K-12 Alignment at SBCTC. Uh, the first um, college and high school legislative report is published. The link is here. We'll drop that in the chat as well. Uh, lots of increases. I put some data. I dropped them. Um, um, a little note in the chat there for college and high school, we are up 58% enrollment 2022-2023 uh, with 96% uh, pass rate. So very similar to Running Start. And that's just for our um, community and technical colleges. So I encourage everyone to go to that legislative report. Um, that is um, required by uh, House Bill uh, 5048 um, to, to take a look at the data there. It's really, um, really interesting. And um, you can kind of look at uh, courses and all kinds of different uh, information there. Um, and then the last point I wanted to mention on this slide is Council of Presidents has a college and high school equivalencies tool. I don't know if everyone has had a chance to look at that yet. It's pretty amazing. It's um, the college and high school equivalencies mapped out for the public uh, baccalaureate, bac baccalaureate <laughs> sector. Um, and so it's a really neat tool. So again, we'll drop the link in the chat there. Um, so you all can, can take a look at that if you haven't yet. Um, but yeah, a uh, lot of exciting work going on, a lot of wonderful data and reports coming out in our dual credit world uh, statewide. All right, next slide. And there's more. <laughs> um, just a couple of other things I wanted to highlight around reports and um, resources. So OSPI's legislative priorities, otherwise known as our decision package, um, is available on our website. There's a link to it and it's coming in the chat. Um, this includes a significant investment or request for an investment in increasing equitable access to dual credit. Um, I'm not going to go into great depth because the information is there for you to access. I will say that it touches on running start and recommends a 6% multiplier to the running start rate. The reason being is we recognize that running start um, is, is very uh, important for student access. It's also very important that we fund um, that we fund the colleges and the high schools to be able to manage that work. So um, the one thing that the six percent is primarily focused on doing is eliminating 
um, fees for Running Start students. Um, the goal is to eliminate fees across the board by embedding those costs into the rate itself. However, there's an added bonus to it, which is that in eliminating fees, if this were to pass, um, we would also see a greater proportion of the Running Start funding retained at the district level. So it's a 6% bump. Any way you slice it, it it's an advantage for students. It's an advantage for everyone. Um, so we are well aware. We have heard the call, and that's uh, baked into our decision package. It also seeks to um, extend the uh, enhance the summer running start funding to 150%. Um, which is what was requested last year, and we got to 130%. But again, we got to 130% because of a proviso that was not tied to headcount. This, again, would be a rate increase that would ensure that, number one, we have enough money to go around because $3 million in the after-exit proviso may not have been enough with the increases that we saw. Second of all, um, we want to make sure that the summer rate also extends to the districts who have to staff up in those summer months. So a rate increase would accomplish both of those things. Um, there is also barrier reduction funding um, included for CTE programs and uh, funding for industry recognized credentials uh, for CTE. So that's all baked into this decision package. There's a lot to read, but you can follow the links and get yourself there. I mentioned before the SAO audit, state auditor's office uh, around the transferability of college and the high school and running start. I'm not going to get into it except to say again that there is a 15% gap between transferability of those two courses. We talked about it before. You can read the whole report there. Um, the next few are just things that I have already referenced in, in OSPI's dual credit listserv um, newsletters. Um, there is information on AP and their exam fee digitization, which is coming in May. 28 exams are going all digital. You'll want to pay attention to that if you manage AP in any way. We also have the DCYF, Department of Child, Youth, Children, Youth, and Families, Education and Training Voucher Program. Um, that can be used for dual credit programs. Seriously encourage you to promote that to your students. It could go into that um, notification that we've talked about previously. Um, we are also seeing the number of students who are applying for um, free and reduced price lunch go down dramatically because so many communities have gone to um, have gone to community eligible per SEP, community eligible provision. Um, so there is a new effort to try to get students still applying through the uh, child nutrition eligibility and education benefit application because there are so many other benefits that come with being classified um, as eligible for these programs. So that's something we want you to keep in mind. The WASAC dual enrollment scholarship application is closed for this year, but I still wanted to highlight it. Should it be reauthorized, it's a great um, resource for both colleges and students. And then finally, um, we still have a tremendous amount of work uh, going on around the high school and beyond plan. Um, getting to a selection and a contract with School Links was only the first step. We are just dipping our toe into the implementation phase of the high school and beyond plan rollout. And so there is a legislative report available. We also have upcoming listen and learn sessions on October 28th, I wanted to highlight. And we really need student and family voice. Really, really need it. So um, please take that information, promote it wherever you can um, with your students and families and encourage them to participate in this really valuable conversation. Next up. All right. I'm gonna breeze through this because we are short on time and we wanna leave time for your questions. Um, the 24-25 RSEVF, as most of you know, it's out. Um, it has been out since last spring and we did not make any changes to last year's. Um, part of our agreement in doing that was that we would make a call for revisions in October. Um, it is late October, but it is still October and we are making our call for revisions. Um, we intended to have a form or a survey ready for you today. We don't. 
but it will go out very, very soon um, and provide you with the opportunity to weigh in on the RSEVF. Uh, want everybody to understand that we, we know that this is an annual conversation about what can be changed, what can be better. Um, so we really value your input and want to re um, iterate that we are looking at solutions. Um, they are sometimes painstaking, sometimes time consuming, but it is something that we acknowledge um, as an antiquated process that we would like to fix. Many of us are going to NASEP in the coming days to try to figure this out together. So um, do stay tuned for that. All right, and finally, summer running start. I'm gonna do a quick overview of the data because it's going to launch us into the opportunity to provide us feedback and give us um, your interpretation of how things went this year. Um, what we know is that this was the first year in which it was sort of fully implemented. We had um, all uh, eligible institutions of higher education participating, including the universities. Um, we had the expansion of after exit eligibility, which not only included graduating seniors within 15 credits of an AA, it also included students who had maxed out their FTE. Um, it was the first year that we did this under the 1.4 uh, FTE limitation. We saw the 130% rate enhancement that I talked about just a moment ago. And to that end, we saw a monumental increase um, we saw it go from only 1,300 students in 2023 up to 6,771. Um, that provides a pretty sound baseline for what we might see going forward. I think it grows, um, but I think 6,000 is, is certainly a good starting place when you consider um, how many students were, were benefited by this. Um, I will say this is only a small snapshot of what is in that running start report. Um, we break it down to the credit level and we'll tell you how many credits were taken. We'll tell you, you know, how much money was spent. There's a lot more to get into, but we're not gonna do it now. I just wanted to present this um, in order to launch into a conversation about summer running start and your feedback on it, which we will do after we just do two more slides of resources and wrap up. All right, we'll make this super quick because we want some time for Q&A. Uh, these are just our dual credit resources we have. So our contacts are on the left side there. And then much of this, if not all, has already been shared in the chat. So we've got our bulletin from OSPI that was just released yesterday. Um, we have the listserv for uh, dual credit for OSPI. So you can go there and, and click that resource. And thank you so much for putting all this in the chat. <laughs> um, and then we also have our listservs, which I manage at SBCTC for running start and college in the high school. And then CTE dual credit is managed by Bill Baldwin. So follow the link there to, to get on those listservs if you're not already. Uh, we've got our updated um, FAQs that we've referenced a couple times already, but just making sure you all have these resources. Um, I mentioned earlier that um, college in the high school equivalencies tool uh, put out by Council of Presidents. Um, there's that on this final page. Um, and then just basically a link to um, our agency's websites for dual credit. So OSPI's dual credit, um, and then uh, COP's dual credit, and then SBCTC's dual credit. All right, let's go ahead and jump to that next page. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I just wanted to plug this real quick. We are going to, we, we kind of utilized this session as our first um, session for our Running Start Virtual Series that our that we put on SBCTC in collaboration with OSPI puts on for our um, uh, Community and Technical College Running Start programs. We're gonna uh, hit the ground running on November 20th. Uh, and then these are all the dates for the rest of the academic year. Um, so please join us on November 20th, 9 to 11 a.m. The first portion will be uh, again, um, more information and then we'll do our breakout sessions and have some time to connect with colleagues. And this is specifically aimed at our Community Technical College Running Start staff, but please everyone is welcome to join if you wanna learn more about what's going on at the college um, portion of Running Start, um, we, we do leave it open to all. So I just wanted to make sure everybody had these dates, had these links, um, and then we always post our uh, our, our um, series on our SBCTC dual credit YouTube page. And this will as well be posted there too. All right, next page. Turn all on. right. And I just wanted to um, let all of you know that I am doing virtual 
drop-in office hours on a monthly basis. We had our first just last week. Um, and for a first time out, I was pleased. We had folks there, which was a start. Um, so I really just want to encourage anybody, especially those of you um, who are in the K-12 system and at high schools and um, counseling students and administering these programs to drop in. Um, I do not lead with a presentation. If I get feedback that that's desired, I can always change gears. It is really just an informal meeting space um, for you to drop in, ask me any questions you may have, but also I hope to start building a community of practitioners um, at the K-12 level who are grappling with the same things and might be able to share experiences. Um, so I don't, I don't pretend to be the one that has all the answers. Um, and so I'm hoping that when um, people show up, they can kind of network and collaborate um, and I can provide some support and guidance in that respect. So really encourage everybody to take advantage of those. Um, and though Stephanie mentioned it before, I still wanna keep um, highlighting the listserv um, at OSPI because it too is relatively new. Um, we only established it last year. And so um, it is where most of our guidance gets pushed out, always with a copy to the SBCTC listservs. But if you're tuned in right now and you heard about this session through, for instance, SBCTC or through perhaps our guidance and counseling or our school counseling listserv, um, do get on that dual credit listserv and the link is in one of the earlier slides. All right. I think that brings us to the end of the formal scripted presentation.